Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of the show. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle, and today we're extremely privileged to have Jim Palmer with Dream Business Coaching with us. Welcome to the program, Jim. Mike, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Hey, doing great. And you know, I was um, reading through your one sheet, and it looks like you definitely have to have uh, three or four Jim Palmer clones to get through and do all the things that you do. So share with us a little bit about your background, what inspired you to become an entrepreneur, and then um, what motivates you to help others? Um, Because you have quite the um, background and offerings for entrepreneurs. Well, you know, there, there's a, a book, I think it's probably 20 years old, I could be wrong, but uh, it's called Get Fired and Get Fired Up. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it was uh, Harvey McKay of Envelope fame there who read a, wrote a book about all the people who started their businesses after getting fired. So I won't admit to being fired, but I, what I say is my position was eliminated. <laughs> so mm. it went she performed was without a, a job, and I decided that even though I knew I would I would become an entrepreneur at some point, at at that point in my time, Mike, which is almost uh, 15 years ago, I still had four teenagers at home, and and I really tried to get another job just to keep the paycheck coming in, and it's that whole never seems to be the right time. But um, after about a, almost a year and a half of unemployment, and at that point I also uh, had cancer, and kind of getting through that, I was at a low point in my life. And I said, you know, I can't go anywhere but up. So I decided to start my business in October of 2001. And, and off to the races I went. And, um, you know, my first, my first business in about four years, five years or so, I was doing multiple six figures. But I, like so many people, I grew up, I grew as, I owned a small business where I was the sole employee. Yeah. And I, I was making good money, but I really had no life at all, Mike. And I decided I need to change that because I don't want to be working 90 hours a week, and I do want to take vacation without my business completely going to zero. So I regrouped, rebranded, and that's when I started my whole online, uh, I have multiple online businesses today, and started that kind of shift in the 2006-2007 time frame. And uh, I, I do, uh, I have 11 people that uh, support me and help me run the various companies, so that really what I do, Mike, is I focus uh, my time on what I refer to as high revenue generating activities, which is yeah. my coaching business and marketing my business, which is doing interviews, do, doing speeches, and um, you know writing books and things like that. So everything else that's kind of a, a task related that that is delegated to somebody. Excellent. And a couple things you said uh, made me think of a couple points. Um, at the at your low point, you. Um, uh, came up with a creative plan. And I've heard um, Les Brown say this, which I'm sure many other speakers have said it, but, you know, when you land on your back, if you can look up, you can get up. And, you know, it really is kind of like that is that low point, but, hmm, while I'm down here, let me look at things from a different perspective, maybe a unique perspective from the ground up, and let me see if I can pull myself up and build up there. I think that was that's a, a really great learning point. Um, and and another aspect too is uh, you you mentioned about being that business owner working you know 90 hours a week. I've seen uh, a lot of quotes before where it's these business owners you know say, "Wow, I'm putting in 12 hours a day," and and someone goes, "Wow, um, I remember when I used to have a part time job as well," you know, and you feel like you get in the business to be your own boss. But in reality, if you don't structure it the right way, you become a slave to that business and you may as well be punching the time clock for someone else because you're allowing that schedule and that business to run you. So can you speak a little bit about, you mentioned you have 11 employees or people supporting, and I would suspect that only a small number of those 11 are actual employees and others are outsourced project management support. So how, when did you come to that realization that you can't do it all, let me bring in some support, and how many, what's that mix of um, project manager support and actual employee? Yeah, I call it uh, when I'm out speaking and, and talking about, you know, just entrepreneurial business building, I talk about it as the question that rocked my world. And in 2005, I, I thought, okay, I'm finally back. I'm doing pretty well. 
my wife Stephanie and I were sitting out back in our yard after dinner one time, one night, and she goes, hey, Jim, I, I want to ask you a question. I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, when you preface, I need to ask you something that's yep. probably not good, right? Like, what do you want for dessert? <laughs> and um, she goes, when are we going to take a vacation? Because the last vacation we had was before I lost my job. So it had clearly been mm-hmm. five years before we've had any time off because my first year in business, Mike, was what I refer to as revenue free. So, I mean, yep. it had been quite a struggle before I started turning some good numbers. And and my immediate thought was, can I afford this? And then I thought, well, yeah, I can afford a week's vacation. But then I I don't know if they could even measure the, the shortness of the time frame in which I went, oh my God, gosh, how can I take off? I mean, at that point, I was doing, I was writing and designing the newsletters, meeting with the clients, answering the phone, overseeing printing and mailing. I mean, everything that had to be done with the business was me. And I thought, if I go away for a week, nothing happens. And that's, that's, it was a really holy crap moment. And I, that's when I had to relook at things and, and And then you don't enjoy the time you are away because you're worried about the business and you're actually probably dipping your toe back in the business while you're away. So in that respect, it's not a true break. Oh, absolutely. And so I kind of went back to school at that point. I I started going to conferences on internet marketing. I learned uh, direct response copywriting. I learned about leverage. And, you know, um, I started reading all these books, including Think and Grow Rich and the new psycho cybernetics and some of these others. And when I really started uh, understanding the power of the subconscious mind, I'll never forget one of those books said, you need to ask yourself this question. And, and by the way, ask it out loud. Don't ask it internally. So you're, you're, you want your ears to actually hear it. And yeah. so the question I asked and anybody that's listening could just adapt this to their own business. So I asked a question based on what I learned in the book that said, how do I leverage my skill and talent for writing and designing newsletters and instead of being paid one client at a time and then hoping, wishing, and praying they come back for another one at any point, how do I leverage that so that I can have multiple people pay me for that for that newsletter? And that's when I actually created No Hassle Newsletters, which is my you know done for you content and templates. I have hundreds of people use that all over this country and several countries. And that was the that was the genesis for how I started shifting. So now with leverage and and taking this temp these templates and multiple people were paying that created recurring revenue and and from there I just started adding multiple business I added a print side to that I added a, a newsletter social media side to that um, I had custom article writing side to that every time someone would ask me about hey who do you recommend for this my, my thoughts switched from I could make a referral or I could create another revenue stream and mm-hmm. you know w- one of the secrets there is you know the, the best way to have a really high income is to cobble together multiple sources of revenue Revenue. Some are larger than others, but they all combine to make you know to make a nice living. And and the and I agree with that a thousand percent. And I would say that there is a caution to that, which screams shiny object syndrome. So how do you fight? You know, ooh, squirrel, and there's a revenue stream I can do, and 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 then you get distracted from building that core foundation in your business. So at what point do you feel like, okay, this is going well? I've got a project manager handling this pillar of my business. I can now, you know, I've got that sandbox over here, parking lot. I've been parking some of these ideas. Let me uh, put a a little bit of effort on this revenue stream because if you get spread too thin, now all of a sudden you're not doing anything like an expert. Well, you need to get very clear on, on what your goals are. And you know, I'm not somebody who has a goal five years out other than I want to retire. I mean, because things change so rapidly, right? So I'm somebody who has a goal for, for one year and maybe three years out. And and what happens is you're right. Most entrepreneurs are so busy looking at chasing squirrels and shiny objects. In reality, you know, I think you can hand the average entrepreneur can handle maybe two or three at the most big yeah. goals. Big I mean goals worth worthy of your time. You can't handle more than that. And so what happens to a lot of entrepreneurs, they say, well, that's a good idea. Somebody says, oh, Jim, hey, let's partner in this. I'll do all the work. We'll just split it. You mail your list, blah, blah, blah. Well, even in reality, if they did all the physical work, you're still going to apportion a, 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 some of your brain time, some of your yeah. bandwidth to thinking, are they doing it? How's it going? How am I? So you, it's always um, – you know, you've got to have your priorities. So I, I have an expression. I actually have this printed out and I put on a big banner at my events. It's called stay focused, kick all distractions to the curb and sleep a little less if you have to. And, mm-hmm. and that's how you do that. So 
one of the one of the um, I have like a little two stage filter that I use because there's again there's no shortage of opportunities. If this is a good opportunity, is this going to move me closer to the goals that I've already set for this year, or is it going to be a distraction? Most of the time, it's a distraction, by the way. And is it somebody I trust? In other words, is this somebody who I have... Uh, and by the way, once you ask that question, most of them go out the window, right? Yeah. Because it just seems like pie in the sky, you know, uh, lottery ticket type mentality, and, and that doesn't work. So in reality, it's, it's, it's a distraction. And then the other one, which I think is really, really helpful is this. If I say yes to this, what will I have to say no to? Because you will have to say no to something. And a lot of people aren't willing to give up, you know, what, what they're focused on. So you just set it aside and you, and you keep moving forward. Yeah. You know, you said something really great and interesting about, is this someone that I trust? And depending on the situation you're in at that moment and how many projects you have going, the answer might be question mark on do I trust them because it might not be that you distrust them. It might be that I don't yet trust them. And is it then worth the energy, the time, the mental energy, the actual time energy to get the, to know that person enough to get that level of trust to then move forward with the project? Because again, it's sometimes it's yes, no, or not yet. And, and I think that, that you have to factor that into the evaluation because if that opportunity is a good one, maybe that person is a good person to work with. You just don't quite know yet. So there there then is that process of your personal vetting and is it worth your time to vet that for that opportunity. But you know, I, I know that a lot of um, speakers and authors have written books on how to ask and answer the right questions yourself. And that's really what you're saying there is it's so powerful to recognize within yourself, I got to ask myself this question. And when I answer it, that's going to be a whole lot better than putting those blinders on. That's right. I mean, um, my latest book is called Decide the Ultimate Success Trigger, and there's, it talks about a lot of the mindset trash that people have. Um, <clears throat> but the genesis of the book is that on, highly successful entrepreneurs are people that have the ability to decide. And um, it was about a couple of years ago, somebody doing an interview just like this asked me, not what's the one thing that you do this. The question was, what's one word that most describes success or the ability to have success, which I thought was a pretty unique question. I thought about it for a second. I said, decide. Well, what do you mean? I said, the very successful people have the ability to quickly ascertain the facts, weigh the pros and cons, yes or no, and then they decide. People who decide keep moving forward. And by the way, yes or no is appropriate. What's not appropriate is I'll think about it mm-hmm. because growing businesses thrive on momentum. And when indecision comes into the equation, that I'm a boater, so I'll use this. It's like throwing an anchor out the back of your boat and trying to get up on a plane. It's just not going to happen. So indecision is is like the enemy of forward progress because it's that it's that open loop in your mind. That's right, and and you keep circling back to it, and it yeah. just gets muddled. So you know, and by the way, people say, well, if you make decisions quickly, aren't you going to make mistakes? Yes, you are. But by the way, as you're growing a more successful business, keep going, going, going. You can absorb some mistakes, and not all. Really, not all mistakes are catastrophic, and you can actually just adjust and twist and, and adapt as you keep moving forward. But not making a decision is, is not going – it's not only not going forward. It usually means you're going backwards. And it's also making a decision. So not make – indecision is a decision. That's right. It's a bad one. So <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a prediction for you. In the next one to two years, you'll refer to this interview of the time that you um, came up with your next book to follow up, Decide, because here is my uh, recommendation to you. The follow-up book to Decide, the title should be Do, because once you've decided, so what? You know, knowledge is power is a fallacy. Knowledge is potential power, so you got to implement it. So now deciding is a wonderful uh, um, summit to get to in your life and business, but now the real work comes in. you got to roll up your sleeves and then do. Well, that's exactly right. And, um, and, you know, one of the things that holds most entrepreneurs back from really achieving high levels of success is the feeling that they need to do it all themselves. So, for example, one of the goals that I've set for this year is to add 100 new members to my various membership sites. Now, 
so that's a decision. So good for me. But what I really feel though, is that I am so busy already, even though I'm a good, I have a good marketing mind. I know I'm not going to be able to dedicate the bandwidth to actually implementing that. So I'm partnering with a very smart marketer, somebody I've known for years, got a good track record. He's ethical and you know, all that. So I'm, I am hiring him and his company to market that part of my business. So I'm, I'm putting skin in the game. I'm investing in it, but I actually know it'll get done or somewhere close to what I would have done on my own had I had I had the time to do it. Yeah, I think that is, and that right there made just confirmed the a couple three points we just made, which is getting that strategic alliance that you trust because you've known that person for years, you know their work, their ethics, and then secondly, once you've decided that that's your goal, how are you going to do it? Well, you then asked yourself, should you be the one to do it or should you bring someone in? And so what a wonderful um, process that that is, and I would submit to you that you can only come to that um, a level of process once you're past early stages of entrepreneurship. So I would ask you, what do you feel that two or three big mistakes you see entrepreneurs make in early stages? I think it really has to do with faith, believe it or not. Um, mm-hmm. First of all, having faith in yourself that what you have to offer, the value you bring to the marketplace is worthy. Um, and I tell people, like in a, in a, if I'm doing a little bit of sales training, I would tell people, look, you could either be weak, need willy or, or, you know, something like that or, or, and it basically where you're, you've given kind of a, a weak mamby pamby type of answer about your program, your product. But, most entrepreneurs that are successful, they know. I mean, if you look at somebody like a Mark Cuban, there, there's not a shred of doubt that he knows what he's talking about and he totally believes in his abilities. And he totally knows that what he's offering is going to help people. And so nothing will stop him. And so if somebody was actually give some kind of a, a weak answer about, well, what do you think about this? Well, I think, you know, there's a possibility I could really help you. And I think, it's, yeah, think about it. Let me know. I think there's a number of ways. But if you say, listen, absolutely, this is brain dead simple because here's why. Blah, 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 blah. I've done this 90 times since you know January already or whatever it is when you talk with certainty and have faith um, that's going to help you move forward when what holds people back is when you get ready to put your foot out there and you don't see necessarily where you're going to land that's saying I don't have faith that what I'm doing is the right thing yeah. And when you have when you have the ultimate faith in in what you're doing, um, you you will roll forward. And rolling forward often means uh, investment, whether it's investment of actual capital or investment of your time. That's required. And so one of the things I teach people, I actually wrote about this and decide is there's three stages of entrepreneurial. Uh, chutzpah, so to speak, and I relate it to finances. So I say one is a, a savings account entrepreneur. The other, the uh, middle one is a uh, stock market entrepreneur. And at the high end, you have your casino entrepreneur. So a savings account entrepreneur, somebody says, let's say you got $10,000. <clears> the savings account entrepreneur is going to go up to the, the corner savings and loan and put that $10,000 in there. And five years later, he's going to come back. That money's guaranteed to I mean there's zero risk that that money won't be there in fact mm-hmm. you're going to have a dollar 26 in interest so good for you right so no risk no reward a stock market entrepreneur there's obviously some risk there it's it's not huge i mean if the entire thing goes kaflooey you could learn you could lose all or part of your uh, principal, but in reality, you know, if history is any indication, you'll probably make anywhere from five to seven, maybe even ten percent return on your money. So you put a little, you put some risk in the game, but that increases your reward. And a casino operator is somebody who takes all their chips, pushes them into the middle of the table, and they bet big to win, and they bet big to win on themselves and their idea. One of the greatest examples in history, in my opinion, recent history, is Fred Smith, who started Federal Express. And so you know, Mike, that he started that company in the late 70s when we were still with the Iranian oil embargo. Yeah, we were having problems with Iran way back then too, right? And um, to prove his concept of overnight delivery, he didn't just like buy a couple of used Cessnas and start delivering packages in Tennessee, Arkansas, and, and Kentucky. He invested in multiple used DC-9 jets. He had to have a pilot and co-pilot in each. He had to have ground crews. He started with used delivery vans. But, I mean, that guy went all in. He bet big. He almost lost it all. He was losing millions of dollars a month for, for a couple of years. But he did turn the corner. He had ultimate faith in his business. 
Did you know also that that started off as a uh, business plan project in his college class? Yeah, and he got like a C, if I remember right. I was going to say he got some. So the, the faith seed started right there because he could have gone, oh, what a dumb idea. But he went past that and then didn't just do, like you said, where it was just, well, let's dip my toe in the water and try it with bicycles or Cessnas. He went all in and did it the right way because he was so had such faith in that uh, idea that he was like, if I'm going to do it, let's do it right to give it the best chance to succeed. You know, in the early days, this was actually, when he launched, it was pre-fax machine. So he started with overnight letters, not even the packages they're doing today. So you remember those, just those flat folders that used to go for yeah. about 20, 25 bucks if somebody wanted. And I, you know, I, I read several of his books. One of them I think is called On Time was a really good one. And he was saying, you know, I'm, so these jets are flying across the country sometimes with 10 and 12 <laughs> letters in them. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the money that was outflowing was enormous, but he held in there until enough momentum took hold and it and he turned the corner you know when they say 80 percent of small businesses fail you know five to eight years out one of the main reasons is they say people run out of money and i think that's true but if you were to like really uh do a post-mortem it's because the owner runs out of guts he runs out of faith to keep Mm -hmm. putting the money in to keep the thing alive until it turns the corner and and there is a point too where you do have to pull the plug or in in more uh, uh relevant terms these days like in the book lean startup you have to pivot so maybe in in a business you don't literally go pull the plug and say we're done maybe you pull the plug for a minute or two so that you can pivot and just kind of do a little bit of a a change of direction because the the value is still there you just might need to change the focus just a little bit Yep, I agree with that. And and I, I'm you know, from my perspective what I do, a lot of that has to do with improper branding and positioning. The what's there should be working, but it's not being positioned correctly. Yeah, it's it's like the the old gold miner story where they quit just before gold and the next guy comes in and boom. So it's like, don't quit too soon. And maybe it is just that little polish or tweak or branding or or, or mindset or positioning. And as you know, positioning um, is in the mind of the consumer, how they view your brand. It's not just the brand color and the logo, but that position you hold on in the market. What What is that message that you're getting out there so that when people think – you know, your company, boom, they think of your competitive advantage. And getting that right many times is that catalyst to, to move things forward. You're exactly right. And, you know, that's, again, talking about the faith part of it, one of the things that helps a lot of entrepreneurs get off the ground is having a, a, a USP, a unique selling proposition. And, and very often it also includes, you know, creating some sort of celebrity of the entrepreneur themselves. And that's where a lot of people really kind of recoil a bit. Oh, I don't want to be the face of the business. I don't want to be out there. And, you know, that's a decision you can make. But I'll tell you, you know, creating the right brand and and pushing your own personal star up there is a great way to grow your business because people do want to do business with with the perceived expert. You you got it. I couldn't agree more. And, and of course, as you can probably imagine, we could continue on and on for hours on end and, and come up with more and more ideas and more and more and go deeper. But let's go ahead and wrap up here with these great points because I think we've really made some excellent um, nuggets and takeaways. Um, if people want to learn a little bit more about you and your businesses, um, what's the best way for them to contact you to learn more with your website? Yeah, so thanks, Mike. My home base is uh, getjimpalmer.com. It's www.getjimpalmer.com. Uh, if they want to get some a uh, little bit of information, all they got to do is hit forward slash Mike. And um, there's a, a free report called Three Little Known Secrets to Working Less, Selling Less, But Making More. I don't even require an opt-in. It's just a free report for your listeners. So, again, it's getjimpalmer.com forward slash Mike. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. I've enjoyed getting to know you, and I love your mindset and philosophy. And I'm uh, again, I just wanted to thank you for taking a moment to be with us on the um, interview today. My pleasure. I'd, uh, happy to come back anytime, Mike. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.